Thanks for that, Robin. Uh, as some of you in the audience will know, my principal area of expertise is in the mathematical modeling of the dynamics of marine populations and of marine biodiversity. My involvement in shark research comes about as a result of a collaboration with uh, three people, Will Robbins and Misue Hisano, both of whom were uh, until recently students at James Cook University and Professor Howard Choate. And uh, I want to thank them for teaching me pretty much everything I know about sharks. Sharks are what marine biologists would call strongly interacting apex predators, and this is one reason why they're of so much interest. By apex predator, I mean that sharks are at the very top of marine food chains. They eat a lot of things, uh, and not a lot of things eat them. By strongly interacting, I mean that sharks are connected to uh, a large number of different elements in marine food webs, and pound for pound, they have very large effects on those species to which they're linked. So if you imagine a marine food web, like the food web of a Caribbean coral reef, uh, as a bunch of bubbles, each of which represents a species, and a bunch of arrows connecting all those bubbles together. So each arrow, say, connects a species with something that it eats. Now, um, in, a food, in any food web, Almost all of those arrows will be very, very thin, indicating very weak links, but a small number will be thick arrows. And a few species will have a large number of thick arrows associated with them. Sharks are uh, like those species. Another reason why marine biologists are interested in sharks is that they have characteristics that make them particularly susceptible to uh, population depletion, to overexploitation. Now, most fishes that aren't sharks have got uh, some characteristics that make them more resilient to overfishing. They sometimes mature relatively early in life, maybe at age five or six for uh, a fish that lives 40 years or more. They tend to produce large numbers of eggs at a time, thousands or even millions of eggs, which they release into the water and are fertilized and develop in the water. An advantage of releasing those eggs in the water is that if a reproductive event fails, well, they simply can produce a new batch of eggs, which they can release the next year or even potentially the next full moon. Sharks are not like this at all. They typically mature very late in life. Gray reef sharks, for example, live for 20 years and aren't reproductively mature until they're 10, halfway through their lives already. Uh, Small-bodied sharks, like reef sharks, tend to have small litter sizes. So again, gray and white tip reef sharks on the Great Barrier Reef will typically produce litters of one to a few pups. And they release those, those offspring live. Uh, they're also pregnant for a long time because they give birth to live young. So a reef shark, again, will be pregnant for about a year before it gives birth. So it only reproduces every other year. Now, these characteristics make sharks comparatively unable to recover quickly from reductions in population size due to things like overfishing relative to many other fishes that are targeted in marine fisheries. Their reproductive biology, if you will, is much more like that of a marine mammal, a whale or a dolphin, or even people, for that matter, compared to, to, to most other fishes. Now that's of concern because fishing pressures on sharks are increasing. Globally, the reported catch of shark has more than tripled just since 1950. Now that's the legally reported catch of sharks. There's also a substantial illegal trade in sharks, mainly resulting from the high value that shark fins have on the international market. Some scientists did something really innovative and they actually quantified how much shark fin was being sold on the international market, and they then back calculated how many sharks needed to be caught to supply those fins. What they found was pretty alarming. They found that the total, the total catch of shark worldwide is probably at least four times higher than the legal catch. In other words, the illegal shark fishery worldwide is probably three times bigger than the legal one. Now, not surprisingly, Estimates of population trends for many shark fisheries around the world report very steep declines. Some estimates as high as 90 to 
decreases in abundance since records first became available. Okay, what about closer to home? Australia is relatively sparsely populated and we have a comparatively well-developed management structure compared to many countries in the world. Well, in the waters in and around the Great Barrier Reef on the east coast of Queensland, the reported catch of sharks has more than tripled just in the 10 years from 1994 to 2003. Now the report that provides these data also has a particularly disturbing sentence in it. That sentence is this, direct estimates of longevity, reproductive rate, and natural mortality rate were not available for, both, for most species. Now as someone who models population dynamics, this is extremely worrying because of course a sustainable harvest is sustainable because individuals are removed from the population by fishing at a rate that's equal to the population's capacity to replenish itself. That capacity for replenishment depends on birth rates, longevity, and mortality rates. If we don't know what that capacity for replenishment is, we cannot know what a sustainable harvest rate might be. Well, in that context, uh, my collaborators and I became interested in the status of coral reef sharks in particular, and uh, Will Robbins, as part of his PhD, began collecting extensive data on the status of white tip and gray reef sharks on the Great Barrier Reef. Now, these guys are of interest um, because they are also subject to fishing pressures. Uh, part of that pressure is due to bycatch in the reef line fishery, that is, when people go fishing for coral trout or red throat emperor, they'll often catch uh, reef sharks instead, and that's partly because sharks are uh, aggressive top predators and they attack bait. Uh, in, uh, quite frequently, when sharks are caught, they're killed and discarded, uh, clubbed or stabbed to death and the carcasses uh, placed back in the water. This means there's virtually no data on mortality from fishing. I think um, we also need to at least consider the possibility that there's illegal shark finning happening on the Great Barrier Reef. Now, Will conducted underwater counts of shark numbers, and he compared shark numbers on reefs where uh, there was no history of fishing with reefs that were legally open to fishing. And he found that white tip reef sharks, uh, their abundances were only 20%, uh, one fifth of the abundances on unfished reefs. Gray reef sharks, which are more aggressive towards bait than white tips, were at 3% of their abundances on unfished reefs. Now, that tells us where sharks are. Where are they going? Well, we'll also collected data on growth, mortality, reproduction, and survival of sharks. And Mizue Hisano, as part of an honors project with me, conduct, used mathematical models to project future population trends. What she found was that white tip reef sharks were declining at a rate of about 7% per year, and gray reef sharks 15% per year. Now, I just want to hammer home exactly how steep those declines are. Okay, if we consider white tip reef sharks currently 20% of their natural abundances, in 10 years that halves to 10% at a 7% per year decline. Less than 20 years, they're at 5% of their natural abundances and less than 40 years, 1% of their natural abundances. Gray reef sharks are currently already at just 3% of their natural abundances. At 15% a year in less than eight years, they're at 1% of natural abundances. In two decades, one-tenth of 1%. That's about one shark per 1,000 hectares of reef, or one shark per 10 square kilometers. Um, and remember, these guys do have to find mates to reproduce. And it goes on from there. Now, I want to emphasize that these two lines of evidence, the underwater, the un abundances and the population trends are based on completely independent data sets, and they tell exactly the same story. And uh, Howard Choate, tomorrow when he talks about sharks, I believe will show you that there's a consistent story emerging throughout the Indo-Pacific region for this. So what? Well, I mentioned before that sharks have strong links to many species in marine food webs, including on coral reefs. One consequence of that is that removing sharks can have effects on coral reef ecosystems through many different pathways, through all those links that sharks have 
with other species. And this does make predicting the net effect of removing sharks hard to predict. But let me highlight one particular pathway. Some of the things that sharks eat are small-bodied predators, like rock cod, dotty fish, and so forth. That consumption of those small-bodied predators produces a downward pressure on their population numbers, which is significant because they eat uh, the babies and the juveniles of herbivorous fishes, which keep the reef clear of seaweed and allow corals to survive and grow. Removing sharks removes that predation pressure, that consumption pressure from those small body predators, uh, which reduces the downward pressure on their abundances, and through that pathway potentially increases the extent to which they limit the survival of juvenile herbivores that reduces rates of herbivory and can potentially reduce the reef's resilience to transitions to seaweed-dominated states. Now, I should emphasize this is one pathway of many for reef sharks, and we don't have a clear idea of how strong this pathway is relative to other pathways. We also don't know how strong the effect of this particular mechanism is for eroding reef resilience compared to other stresses faced by coral reefs. But we do know that this pathway exists. And that alone should give us pause. But even if we ignore the potential benefits for sharks for healthy ecosystem functioning, one thing we should recognize is that tourists pay money to look at sharks. And they pay a lot of money to look at sharks. And as fisheries, coral reef fishery, coral reef, sorry, coral reef shark populations uh, collapse around the world as they are, then those countries that manage healthy shark populations uh, can only increasingly benefit from those populations through tourism. And of course, that's apart from the potential for a, a, a sustainable fishery for sharks, a modest sustainable fishery that might be supported by healthy shark populations, if those can be maintained. And the value of such a fishery will also grow as shark populations around the world collapse. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll say thank you for your attention. Thank you.